And uh, as a matter of fact, and, and then I would come back here, still holding my consular passport. Um, and then I would disappear like many other people disappeared into, into the woodwork, so to speak. And then Haskell, I don't remember why, but uh, certainly uh, I wasn't asked for that. I didn't know that Haskell had to go to London. On his affairs, he had an office in London as well. And um, feeling maybe he was ill already before he went, I, never, I was never told. But he was taken to hospital, I think he had an operation. And I suppose if, if it happened now, he would be in hospital for a week or two and he'd come home. But here, in, he was there in hospital for five weeks. And our time limit ran over. I needed his, his, uh, his uh, signatures and so on. And if, uh, from my point of view, he disappeared. He we went to the hospital and I didn't even know where he was. I don't know to this day what exactly was wrong with him. Anyhow, he came back after the time, and I was trying to work out what kind of a scheme I could make to get back into the country. He came back from London and he told me that uh, uh, as the office was closed, that was time that Jabotinsky wanted me to come to London started a weekly paper. I, mean, I agreed to do. <coughs> I had no argument for not doing it and uh, London was just as good as South Africa from my point of view. I didn't get to London until a year later because there was no money. If Jabo wrote to me at some stage, and people who had promised to, to fund a paper but hadn't kept the promise. And so I remained in South Africa a whole year and worked for the party. I traveled some raising money for, for uh, immigration, for our FLP campaign, and writing for the, what had become the Jewish Herald, the original 11th hour had become the Jewish Herald, and making speeches here and there. As far as I know, it was in that period that, I think it was then that we started an organization called the Norco Club, the kind of front organization for the Divisionist Party, or what had become the New Zionist organization. Anyway, I was kept busy that year, and I also got married that year. At the end of 30, the end of 39. It made after the declaration of war, after the war started in December. And um, in, the, well, in the man who had organized Sevotinsky's visit in 1938 uh, had gone back to London, I think already, had gone back to London, uh, and up home Levine. He had made a very successful. The uh, Tinsky too had been very successful because Levine had uh, concentrated not on Jabotinsky's public oratory but on uh, true uh, uh, parlor meetings where he could meet the uh, active people who might do something for the party. And it's a uh, result that the party was built up with a lot of younger professional people, and as I said, the party became the, the leading party in the, in the 
whole dynamics of innovation. And I think it was because of the, the wind being in London, I can't remember that. Maybe he, maybe he still was in South Africa and went to London before I did. That we talked about starting a paper, whatever happened, the Wien had contacts in London, I couldn't have been otherwise. Yeah. <coughs> However, I was stuck in South Africa until Jabotinsky decided to, to travel to America. And he was taking with him two members of the executive of the organization and he wanted to create a committee which would act as a caretaker committee in Madeline, take the and run the movement. He was going to start his campaign for the Jewish army. And he wanted Haskell to come to London and he wanted me to come to London. But one couldn't uh, leave uh, at one uh, then given date, you know, there was no regular, regular uh, shipping service. So one had to hang around and wait for a ship to arrive. The result was that we left South Africa only towards the end of February. And by the time I got to London, Jabo had left for America. Haskell never came to London. And, uh, <coughs> Levine managed somehow to find enough money to start off the paper. And a month after I arrived in London, he published the first number of what became the Jewish Standard. That's what it was called then? That's it. That's what it was called then, too? That was the name of the paper at the time? The Jewish Standard. At the time, that was the name of the paper, from the beginning? Yes. Well, it remained that way until it was closed a few years ago, right. some years later. <coughs> uh, standard, well, finally pursued two, two issues. One was Jewish Army, and the other was the treatment of of uh, refugees or people whom Britain had allowed to come into the country and uh, who were now being treated with a great deal of suspicion. Many of the Jews who came to England as refugees were now looked at with, uh, with uh, very suspicious eyes because they were, they were uh, Austrians or Germans by uh, citizenship. And there was a lot of noise about this in the stand, but look at this. Once we started the paper, of course we had to continue it, and it was a continual struggle because we didn't have money. Now, the, the Veen's wife and my wife worked in the office, and they did all the clerical work in the office. And I ran the editorial side of the paper. I went to the printers two days every week, I stood around, and Levine had found a firm of Jewish printers who never who never produced a newspaper in their lives. They were, they were jobbing printers, you know, they made cards and, and so on and so forth. And they used to have to stand around telling the, telling the printer where to put the words in the paper. I had to do the, the whole job of, um, not only of editing, but of uh, uh, you know, what, what do you call it? I'm not putting the paper together. The layout? Mm -hmm. Layout. Layout, yeah. And so I did that work right through the blitz. I used to travel to East London, right obviously northwest London. And uh, it was a 
Germans at first <coughs> concentrated on East London, <coughs> the, uh, the port area, in the early days of the Blitz, after they spread out over the whole of London. And I, uh, meantime, a quarrel, that's right, a quarrel arose between the group in London and the group in America, because when Jabodinsky died in August 1940, the people he taken with him to America decided that they were the leadership of the movement. And the people that, that had left, been left behind in London decided that they were the leadership of the movement because the leadership was in London. And Jabotinsky was the, was the, uh, was the key uh, as a, one of our people had said uh, the uh, he had a Latin axiom for it, Ubi, Ubi Zabotinsky, every movement, wherever Zabotinsky is, what is your movement? Okay. It's either Ubi Ubi or Ubi 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 whatever, how that could be done in the middle of the war, uh, and that would decide where you have leadership. <coughs> and so I was asked to go back to South Africa and try to organize a world conference on South Africa. First get the South Africans to agree, and of course they would be expected to provide the cash for it, uh, and then get somebody from here, from, from uh, Palestine, to come to the come to the conference because you couldn't get into Palestine. So I spent several months in South Africa and nothing was arranged. The, the, the Palestinians thought that it was worthwhile struggling to get into Palestine and neither the Americans nor the Londoners could do anything about it. You, you, you couldn't force the British to agree to your coming. But it shouldn't like the reason this anyhow. And so I came back empty handed to London. While in South Africa, Haskell asked me to stay in South Africa. As far as he was concerned, the death of uh, Jabotinsky broke him up completely. And uh, I could understand that he's wanting me to stay in South Africa. But I hadn't gone to... Uh, I had gone to Jabotinsky's uh, request, but uh, I uh, worked in the movement, and uh, I'd left a wife behind there by now. Maybe I would have stayed in South Africa, I don't know. But I didn't agree. Haskell was very annoyed with me about it. What he wanted me to ask you for is a purely personal matter. It would be nicer to have somebody, somebody who was Jabotinsky, so to speak, to do around him. And uh, at the beginning of 42, uh, Haskell was killed in a road accident. Yeah. He ran out of his apartment one night while it was raining, and uh, apparently it was really careless, and was knocked over by a car. That was shortly after I returned from uh, from to London. I've often wondered if that, if I, if I had stayed in South Africa, whether that wouldn't have made a difference in, in Haskell's uh, behavior on that particular day. One thing I did discover in South Africa, I went to see the the, uh, the man who was at the same time Minister of Finance and the Minister of Education, a very brilliant young uh, Afrikaner named Hofmeyer, uh, died young, by the way. And uh, uh, I 
came to see him uh, to, to, to tell him about the, uh, the campaign for the Jewish army. And uh, uh, when we sat down to talk, he said, I remember you, I, I, I used to read your reports every month. From Jerusalem. He didn't tell me what his reaction was. <laughs> Couldn't have been bad because I was giving them information that they didn't have, probably. I tell it, I came back to London uh, empty handed and discovered that, that uh, Levine had resigned. And I was out of work. That resigned as well. I wasn't going to. I wouldn't have resigned anyhow with the Levine, Levine resigned or not. I wasn't interested in having quarrels anywhere. Wherever I was. So I started looking for a job, which wasn't very uh, easy. I didn't. I practically knew nobody there. And uh, as I was told, I knew to want to find a job uh, as a newspaper, on a newspaper. And I was told that you need two, condi oh, two conditions for finding a job in a newspaper. Either you have an uncle who's, who's running a newspaper, or you have previous experience. And I said, no, the work, when, do you, when do you have experience? From where can you get experience if you can't get a job in here? So this went on for some months and I even registered for uh, training in uh, uh, they wanted training in uh, well, I don't know what you call it um, the arms factories needed a lot of people do uh, simpler jobs like Creating wood in this way, whatever, I don't know, carpentry. Yeah. I even signed up for such training. And then I couldn't take it. It was then that, uh, that uh, my uh, trouble with, my, with one of my legs started. Uh, I had spent so many days standing at the printers, I think, for, for making the paper up to, making up the paper, that I think it affected my leg. And so, uh, I didn't stay, I, I didn't complete the training. I continued looking for a job, uh, and seeing, but, but my wife had landed a very good job. Um, she became the, the secretary of the uh, managing director of the Osram Lamp Company, which was the Department of General Electric. and. Uh, He was a, a Greek, a, a man of Greek this extraction named Kelioti. And he told us something very interesting. He was an important guy in the, uh, uh, from the government point of view, and was a member of the, one or more of the committees dealing with labor relations. And, uh, he was on the same committee as, or he was on a committee, which uh, at whose meetings Ernst Bevan attended, uh, if not always, sometimes, uh, he was the Minister of Labour. And Kuliotti uh, told Dr. Stormawai one day that, you know that Bevan is anti-Semitic. No, that's a good guy. He said, do you know that when he comes to a meeting, he never omits to say something nasty about Jews, even if it's nothing relevant, relevant to what to the discussion, which is quite important information, <laughs> as it turned out. 
when he became foreign minister later on. Do you want to take a break now and resume, like, you want me to come back next week sometime? Would that be... Would you like to take a break? And then I'll c I can come back next week, if you'd like? No, at this moment, I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. <coughs> Um, and then, uh, a miracle happened, during the period when the Wotensky was still, was still alive, there was a lot of talk about cooperation between the Wotensky and Weizmann. And uh, one of the people who, uh, who was in touch with us, Londoners, on the subject, was somebody who, had a, who was friendly with both sides. He was, he was a friend of Jabotinsky and he was a friend of Weizmann's. A man named Sag Sagal. I had met him a few times, didn't know him particularly well. One day he met me in the street. And uh, asked me what I was doing and I told him I was looking for a job. As it happened, he, Sir Gull, and his family had uh, evacuated from London. A lot of people evacuated from London. Uh, <coughs> to nearby rural areas because of the German bombing. And one of his neighbors in this village, I think in Buckinghamshire, was the head of the uh, morgue, the head of the library at the Daily Express newspaper. So he talked to this man. This man needed, needed assistance. So I was invited to come and work in the library of the Daily Express. And uh, from the library, of course, you meet all kinds of people, basically, who help them find, mm -hmm. find material and so on. And so I got friendly with a news editor. And to cut a long story short, I got a job as a sub-editor, what we call here a night editor. And that's where I stayed until the end of the war. I could have stayed, I suppose, to this day if I wanted to. And I probably would have, would have been, would have made myself a candidate to edit, but again, Um, talking about 1943, beginning 43, 43, 44, 45, 46, I suppose I was there for three, three, three and a half years, something like that. And then, after the war, a delegation came to London from the Revisionist Party. And, uh, I don't remember why. I wasn't happy already with the Louisa's party. But I have to cut the story short. And they persuaded me to uh, do what? I don't know what it was that they persuaded me. <laughs> what what uh, position they persuaded me to take. I was to be the secretary or the executive or something like that. Because the one thing I, I, I do remember very well was that then that the uh, British made the agreement with Trans Jordan to uh, uh, give Trans Jordan independence. 
and we protested against this. We made a lot of noise about it. And uh, I had then my funny interview with a member of the American Senate named uh, Tom Connolly. <coughs> when, when the, uh, the agreement was made, or was about to be made, I don't remember, we decided on a campaign of propaganda against it, and <coughs> it was then that the United Nations had its first meeting. You might remember the United States, we may have read or knew, the United Nations had its first meeting in London. It's only after that that went to America. Mm -hmm. And uh, we decided that we would lobby the delegates to the first meeting. <coughs> and I uh, was, uh, yes, well, I suppose I, I became a member of the governing body there somehow, because there was a decision of the body. Um, uh, we agreed that uh, we, would, we would lobby people, and I was given two, three, but at least two, the delegates to talk to. One of them was Polish, the other was the American delegate. <coughs> that was Mr. Conley. I was told that uh, I could meet him at 12 o'clock at the office, at his office in Lancaster House, where the, where this, uh, the meeting, where the, meet, where the uh, first meeting was taking place. When I arrived at the meeting, at the, uh, at the uh, office, knocked on the door. A man came out who was the, uh, he looked exactly like every uh, Southern American center, American center from the South that I'd ever seen at the cinema. Very red face, very, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of white hair. And as soon as I walked into the room, he clapped me on the shoulder and said, Hi, Sam, what can I do for you? <laughs> that was a nice beginning. So we sat down opposite each other at a desk, and I gave him a rundown on what, on what we had to say about that show. How it had been taken out of the mandate, and so on and so forth. And. Uh, it took me about 20 minutes. While I was telling him this, he sat there and he was taking his glasses off and he was putting them on again, staring at me fixedly. And he was doodling on the fad, very, very intent, very, very concentrated on what I was telling him. When I was through, he looked at his watch and he said, well, Sam, that's very interesting. I have an appointment at 12.30, he said. He got up, I got up. He went to the door with me and as I was about to <coughs> go out, he said, don't worry, Sam, I'll do my best for Egypt. <laughs> That's what I remember of that period. <laughs> At any rate, apparently fate takes a hand in these things because because I had agreed reluctantly to do this work for the Revisionist Party at the time, wasn't. I didn't believe that we'd get anywhere. The party arranged for me to get one of the certificates that was given to the Revisionists to go to, to get into Palestine. So I came back here on a a Jewish agency certificate. And this was in the summer of 1946. End of June, it must have been the beginning of July. And I found, we found, a, uh, a little house for, as a temporary lodging 
in the Catamount, Jerusalem, which belonged to a, an official in the British administration who was going on leave and who was interested, of course, in finding a tenant. When we discussed it with him, I don't remember his name, it was agreed that I don't remember what we were going to pay him, and he was to give us his, the final reply and, and, and give us the date of his departure and so on. And it uh, was delayed, uh, we waited. Finally, it was arranged. Why had we had to wait? Because they had, they had uh, tried to check on me to see whether there's any reason why I should be treated as an unfriendly individual. Well, I could have been, and I must have been, in some of their files, because of what had happened in uh, Jerusalem in the Royal Lift. But the Yibun had blown up uh, the, um, the CID building. So I think that whatever was known about me disappeared. At any rate, I had no problem at all. And actually, we used to entertain one of the neighbors who was also an official of the government and whom I used to, uh, with whom I used to argue, giving the, the Jewish underground point of view. That was the best, uh, it worked out as the best protection I had because otherwise, I, if I were one of them, I would be a bloody fool to talk like that. This man had a, uh, had a quite a large appetite for whiskey and the official from whom I, we got that little house had a big cellar of, of drinks. Uh, so we could always leave this man thirst. Get his name, a nice chap. He was the, uh, he was in charge of the uh, uh, property of, uh, oh, what do they call them? Absentees or something like that. Right. And so it was, uh, I don't remember who got in touch with whom, but we got in, I got in touch with the, the Irgun people in Jerusalem. And uh, after about a month, something like that, three weeks or a month, arranged my first meeting with Begin in the underground. And I met him on the same day as the uh, King David Hotel was blown up. <coughs> but that is where I, I have to stop on. Where is my Second interview, February 19th, 2004. You know what they uh, have to do if we had, you know, because uh, some relief to have somebody to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't he worried about his soldiers? Well, what did it help if he were worried? There was nothing he could do. He just had to wait for his, for his boss. Uh, <coughs> Well, that meeting consisted largely of a report uh, of my insights on British policy. Oh uh, no, on, on the British condition and on British policy. I imagine that he had his own views of British policy. He probably needed you more for the condition. Well, you're right. Um, it's, not so, it's not so much policy. Um, it, it's really the, the um, My concept of the impact of British poli of, of the British condition on Irgun policy. Mm -hmm. That's okay. what I'm saying. Um, 
Britain was in a far less, far less economic state. Uh, it was, it was uh, largely dependent on American aid. And uh, um, it was uh, um, perhaps somewhat unjustifiably unpopular in America. Mm. Not to speak, not to speak of uh, a, uh, considerable hostility to Europe. Mm -hmm. Although I don't want to go into detail with one, I should write this up one day. We had the French and the Italians. Uh, the French would give an end, would give an end to the Germans. So this is one year after the first of all. The Italians had fought. Uh, and uh, both, in both countries, There was considerable city. Uh, and some of it, some of it was due to British policy yeah, in, in Palestine against the Jews. You know, you'd have to sit down and analyze this sort of thing, but this, this is uh, 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 my clear recollection of the state of affairs at that time which lasted uh, and uh, I ventured oh and um, on top of it uh, inside Britain uh, <laughs> there were many people including Mr. Churchill who, who were uh, uh, <coughs> inclining to the view that in Palestine, um, Palestine uh, uh, chapter, Britain's Palestine chapter should be brought to an end because it was much too expensive, mm -hmm. not only in soldiers' lives, which uh, there not, not many casualties here for the country like Britain, but in, in uh, economically, in my middle of a sentence, I ventured to to prophesy that if the ongoing uh, cooperation between the Irun and the Haganah but to continue, uh, I didn't mention it at the start ever, it's still on. The, 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 um, um, what do you call it? What do we call it? What do we call it more than that? The what? The combined, combined. Uh, the Mary. Eh? The Mary. No, 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 no. Uh, the Haganah had agreed to work with the Irgun uh, at the end of November of the previous year. I should have 
mention it. Um, maybe you can put it in now. In November of 45, to the dismay and almost the disbelief of the uh, Jewish agency, and Haganah, of course, instead of having what Churchill had once promised Weissler to have the plum and the plum and the pudding, they were now being given a dose of anti-Semitism by the British government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this force of the Haganah, mm -hmm. the realization that you had to fight, mm -hmm. and that's when they joined with the Yagur in a united resistance movement. That's right. The Mary. Eh? That's what I said. Hagana, the Yirgun agreed to the, to the ultimate uh, responsibility right. of the uh, Hagana, but uh, operations were separate, didn't actually fight the right. um, operations. And, uh, and so, well, that, that, the, the, that being uh, we made clear, um, uh, I said to Begin, that if this continued, I couldn't see the British lasting here for more than nine months. <laughs> what nine months? I don't know. <laughs> I thought that a year was going to be too much, and six <laughs> months are going to be too little. But I remember clearly that. Big and raise his eyebrows at this he hadn't worked out <laughs> the dates. I mean he was quite certain that we would be that we would that we would throw them out in the end, but he didn't he hadn't uh, uh, put the dates on. Now actually what had happened instead of he Hagana gave up the fight uh, three months later there approximately or the well less after the King David uh, uh, operation. It took some time before they actually gave up. Uh, and so, in this links at the time, the, the British decided on leaving the country 15 months later, in September 1947. Yes, sir. So, we're so far out.